My grandfather had this amazing saying. He always said, I hope it lasts, Amy, I hope it lasts. And I never knew if he was talking about marriage, life, or philanthropy. Um, but at the end of the day, I think he was referring to legacy. How do we transfer values? How do you reinforce it over and over again? Um, I think if my grandfather was here today, he'd be so proud, and he would have an affirmation that it does last, that there will be a continuity for the next generation. I'm a California Jew. I grew up in Northern California. My mom is Jewish. My dad's Jewish. Therefore, I'm Jewish. But we were not in a community that was reinforced. There wasn't a Jewish neighborhood. There was maybe a couple kids in my, my elementary school that were Jewish. And actually, tonight, my hair looks pretty good. But back in the day, I had this giant curly hair, and everybody used to tease me. They would say, Amy has a bread loaf. And I thought, what do you mean? And they would literally look at me and think that my hair looked like a loaf of bread. And I remember immediately feeling kind of a disconnect and feeling that there was this cultural isolation and really not feeling that I knew where I belonged. This is Northern California in the early 70s. Um, so it was so interesting that our family is uh, sixth generation Washingtonian. And what gave me great comfort was coming into um, as a little girl, we travel to the East Coast three times a year for weddings or farm mitzvahs. And it was such so much love and so much family and so much reinforcement of all those good values. And that's really what happened and where the, this would come from. Um, one of the most vivid memories I have was my grandfather would host Passover, which you can imagine. Um, tons of people around a big table and beautiful meals and lighting candles and saying the prayers. But when it came time to talking about the Ten Plagues, that you would dip your finger in wine, and he said, no, we're gonna go down to the pool. He had this indoor outdoor pool. He said, we're gonna pour the whole cup of wine into the pool. So as a little girl, I had an early memory, this visual imprint of, can you do that? Is that appropriate? But he made learning about Judaism so much fun. It was something that was so affirming to me that how do you kind of internalize that at such a deep level? He also lived in the oldest Baptist home in Georgetown. And in one of his great rooms was a library. It was a wood paneled room. And what's incredible, in the corner of his room was these 10 commandments that were from the third oldest synagogue in Washington, from Otis Israel. And he'd push a button, and literally these 10 commandments would come out, and he would at that moment share with us the story of what it was to be Jewish, and thou shalt honor thy mother and thy father. And you can imagine as a little girl what imprint that would have. Even if you didn't even know what the Ten Commandments were, you knew that there was something really powerful um, about being able to kind of internalize what that would mean. Learning about Judaism was not about going to learn about it in a synagogue or a traditional way. It was very unconventional. Pouring wine at the pool, having these visual iconic memories of, of uh, the Ten Commandments coming out of a wall. Those are the type of things that when I would go back to California, I didn't fully internalize what it was like to be Jewish, but I knew that it was something different, something special. So I came on into my life and I wanted to uh, study in Israel to get my graduate degree um, in international public health. And I remember loving Israel. It was a place that I, after being a righteous California girl, I thought I'm gonna go get some discipline. I'm gonna go meet God, right? That's why you go to Israel and you have this pretty intense experience, or at least that's what I thought. And yet, it was 1990, it was the Persian Gulf War, and I was greeted with bombs and gas masks. And it, immediately, my family got very nervous. I said, Amy, it's time to come home. This is dangerous. You know, you really should come back. And I did listen to them, because you're a young, unbridled 20-year-old. But when I came back, um, I realized that this is not where I meant to be. I needed to go to Israel, because I, there was something really special happening there. There was a place where I felt I really could call home. After I received my master's degree, I ended up moving to Nepal. And there was, I did my early years of doing work there. And uh, my grandfather said, Amy Ann, why are you trying to save the world when you need to come save America? And I said, Pop, um, you're never gonna believe this, but there's so much that I feel more Jewish today than I ever have before. It was one of the most incredible Passovers I've ever experienced. At the time, it was the early 90s, we had the um, Chinese American Jewish ambassador, Julia Chang Block. She hosted one of the most incredible Passovers I've ever been to. And I said, Pop, you don't have to worry. All those values that you ingrained in me are now coming to fruition. Because now I can practice all the philosophy and principles about our Jewish identity and getting back into the world that I actually feel more connected with you than ever before. So my grandfather really gave me an opportunity to practice what he was preaching. And from there, I had the opportunity to move back to Washington, D.C. And I had this gift of spending the last 13 years of his life with him. So imagine from 80 to 93, 
We would hit the pavement, walking the streets, talking about his legacy, talking about real estate, talking about banks that he had started, and just internalizing having that one-to-one -one experience with him, which was so special. Um, and slowly started to internalize his values and his ethics. But what was incredible is that he would transmit another truth of his, was give 17 ounces to the pound. And what does that mean? Give a little bit more than what's expected. Don't just do the ordinary, do the extraordinary. So can you do that a little bit more? He did that because he ended up creating a foundation back in 1952. And the last 13 years of his life, he thought, what can I do to transfer those values and that principle of philanthropy to you? And I said, well, Pop, I don't want to do the philanthropy that you're doing. Uh, supporting orthodoxy and you think morality is going to save the world, but there's so much more to philanthropy. It's actually about investing in people and ideas. It's what you do so beautifully. Is there a way that we could kind of go forward into the 21st century and really marry your passion uh, and purpose with my new generational mindset? So at the end of his life, he passed the foundation on to me. And I will tell you that um, it was an incredible journey. Philanthropy is so much more than just giving away money. It's about giving your time. It's about giving your service. And that, in fact, there's you can't do it in isolation. That it's part of a broader ecosystem. That when you try to do the kind of philanthropy that we want, it's going to take people coming from different sides of the aisle, inviting that different kind of um, opportunity for them to, to learn and work together. And so I've invited... Um, different friends of mine, Muslims and Catholics, and, and not just in the Jewish community, but a much broader um, ecosystem to be able to give back. So when I think that my grandfather, um, his legacy remains very strong within me. And I think that if he was sitting here with us today, we'd be looking into each other's eyes, we'd be holding hands, and he would ask me, Amy Ann, I hope it lasts, I hope it lasts. And there's no doubt that I would look into his eyes and say that it does.